11.45pm, February 12th, 2016. Young British indie band Viola Beach is coming to the end of a rousing 45-minute set at the Dynamo Club in Sweden. They are performing at Where's the Music Festival, a showcase for emerging talent. It's the band's prelude to a busy touring schedule and a summer slot at Glastonbury. They are bent on breaking the 250 gigs in one year, set by their indie band peers in 1975. Fans and music industry pundits have predicted a glittering future for the young men from Warrington, who had recently completed an impressive live studio set for the BBC. Tragically, the band never makes it back to the UK. In fact, they don't even make it back to their hotel that night. Their manager, Craig Tarry, is driving the car. A Nissan they had rented earlier that day after landing at Stockholm's Arlanda Airport. For reasons that remain a mystery, Craig Tarry is at the wheel of the vehicle that speeds through two lowered barriers on a lift bridge. The bridge is closed to traffic and is in the process of opening to allow an oil tanker to pass along the river below. At 2am, witnesses see the dark Nissan crash through a safety barrier at about 45 miles per hour, striking the edge of the rising bridge section. The vehicle plummets 80 feet into freezing canal water. Chris Leonard, 20. River Reeves, 19. Jack Dakin, 19. Thomas Lowe, 27. And manager Craig Tarry, 32. Sadly perish in an incident that police investigators describe as inexplicable. Join us as we examine the mysterious facts and take a supernatural look behind the death of the four young men of Viola Beach and their loyal manager. This is Death by misadventure. To fully appreciate how tragic and inexplicable this incident is, we only need to look at the paths the band members took that enabled Viola Beach to be formed and what led them to the festival in Nürshopping on February the 12th, a trip that ultimately sealed their fate. It all began at The Lounge, a bar in Warrington's cultural quarter, bar owner Adam Lawson becoming the catalyst for the creation of the band. Lawson had already met Thomas Lowe in 2005 at Leeds Music Festival. Lawson then 21, stumbled across the 16-year-old who found it necessary to carry the future liquor trade entrepreneur back to his tent. Lawson gave Lowe a job and together they hammered their way through the former hair salon to create a thriving hostelry. Next on the scene was Chris Leonard. He too was given a job by Lawson. Leonard had a friend, Jack Dakin. Dakin played the drums. Together, Leonard and Dakin started the band in 2013 with two others, Frankie Coulson and Johnny Gibson. They called themselves Viola Beach and recorded Chumley Brown in May 2014, produced by Sugarhouse at Catalyst Studios. That autumn, Coulson and Gibson left the group to go to university. The future of Viola Beach was uncertain until Thomas Lowe jumped at the chance to be a rock star. He already knew Leonard and Dakin from the lounge. In October, Leonard, Lowe and Dakin recorded Cherry Vimto. A month later, they have swings and water slides in the bag, a two-day studio session costing them £400. In early 2015, Viola Beach auditioned for a new guitarist. River Reeves, originally from Cornwall, becomes the fourth member of the band. Manager Craig Tarry joins soon after and introduces Viola Beach to professionalism, deleting all their pre-2015 social media and imposing a pre-gig two-beer limit on the bright young indie stars. The BBC caught wind of Viola Beach. They described their music as infectious anthems with elements of slacker pop. The band is subsequently invited to perform on its music platform for new talent, BBC Introducing. A live session for BBC Radio 1 
was followed by stints on the BBC Introducing Stage at Reading and Leeds festivals. Swings and Water Slides was added to the BBC Radio 1 playlist in September 2015. They released their second single, Boys That Sing, Like a Fool, on the Communion label on January 22nd, 2016. Despite the exposure and voracious appetite for gigging, funds are short, and this isn't helped by the closure of the lounge, an establishment that had proved so useful as a source of flexible income for the band members. Although they have a van, the gig fees for Yellow Beach Command very often won't even cover the fuel bill. But family members and friends rally round with support, providing food parcels and monetary donations. Chris Leonard's mum lets them all move into an Edwardian property she owns. Thomas Lowe is given the £5,000 earmarked for his wedding, and the young guns have been paying off their purchase of their guitars using credit cards. Chris, Thomas, Jack and River promise to pay them all back for their kindness, when they are famous. That fame looked to be coming their way, only for it to be cruelly and so suddenly snatched from their grasp. Their Shire Dynasty tour van had clocked 13,000 miles by the time Viola Beach leave England for Sweden on February the 12th, 2016, with 28 festival gigs already booked in the months ahead. Their final gigs in England are in support for Blossoms on Wednesday night in Reading with another set in Lemontine Spa the night after. By Friday lunchtime, Viola Beach and their manager are stepping off a plane at Arlanda Airport, north of Stockholm. They check into the Radisson Hotel, rent in a San from Avis, and set off for Nur Shopping, 100 miles east of the capital city. Where's the Music Festival is a showcase aimed at local music industry bosses and have paid Viola Beach £780 for taking part. Their agent, Mark Bennett, is already at the venue, a converted textile factory, when the band hit the road for the two-hour drive. He rings the group en route. He tells them, Get used to me asking where in the world you are, as you'll get to play everywhere. The band posted on their social media page, Nur Shopping, we play Dynamo, Halana, tonight at 9.30pm at WTM Festival. Viola Beach arrives at the festival around 8pm. They share a dressing room with up-and-coming Swedish band, Psychophant. John Hugo Olsen, 22, took one of the last pictures of the group, and said later that the band had been in good spirits before the gig, and that he had shared a drink with Chris, Jack, Tom, and River. They were messing about, he said, having a laugh and all sitting on each other. That's when I took the picture in the dressing room. They wanted to know about Sweden, and learn some of the languages, and asked how to say, you're beautiful. 9.45pm. Leonard leads the group through the half-full venue in a woman's faux leopard skin coat, Music industry figures loiter at the bar, waiting to be wowed, while the young festival goers absorb the vibe. Viola Beach, we are. So I'm 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 Chris and I play guitar and sing. I'm Tom, play bass. That's the (laughs) winner. I'm I'm Jack, I play the drums. Uh, uh, I'm River and I play the guitar as well. The four-piece take to the stage after Psychophant, who stay to watch Viola Beach in action. The young stars in the making from England start their set with Swings and Water Slides before playing their new single, Boys That Sing. They finish their eight-song set with Cherry Vimto. Viola Beach's agent is cozying up to Falkert Koopmans, the founder of promoters FKP Scorpio. Koopmans is impressed by what he hears from the new British indie poppers. Every song here is a hit single, Koopmans tells Bennett, as the 30 minute set comes to an end and the charismatic Leonard lobs his guitar stand into the crowd. After the performance, Viola Beach joins the crowd. Olsen chats with drummer Jack Dakin. They were amazing, John Olsen reminisced fondly when interviewed. I'd never heard of them before but I was really taken by them and their music. I was watching them and thinking, this will be the future. 
Olsen also chatted to manager Craig Terry. According to Olsen, Terry had not been drinking. A while later, Viola Beach is invited to an after party. They decline the offer. They had to get back to the airport as they booked to support Blossoms again in the UK the next night. Eager to get on their way, Chris, Tom, Jack and River climb into the Nissan. Their manager, Craig Tarry, slides into the driver's seat and starts the engine. Here's what unfolded that fateful night in the early hours of February 13th. The canal runs between the lake and the Baltic Sea. Three bridges, one for rail and two for road traffic, provide land vehicles with a passage across the waterway. The canal has been constructed to carry vessels that are significantly higher than the bridge. Each of the bridges has an opening mechanism that rises from the middle. Red lights warn of the hazard ahead, one kilometer from the approach. Signs bearing a pictogram of a lifting bridge are illuminated, can be found along the highway closer in. Red and yellow barriers fold across the roadway, around 150 meters from the section where the bridge is opening. Here, the highway is three lanes wide with a slip road on the far left as an emergency route. It's 1.58 a.m. when the lift bridge over the canal begins opening. 2 a.m. The Nissan crashes through the first safety barrier at around 45 miles an hour, and then the second set of barriers at a speed in the region of 65 miles an hour. With the bridge rising in front of them, the black Nissan just keeps on motoring. The rising bridge has risen to just under five feet when the car strikes it and plunges 82 feet into the freezing water. A few moments later, a 125 meter long oil tanker runs over the wreckage. The captain views an object fall from the bridge as his ship is approaching, but crew members assume it is a large chunk of snow they are given the green light to proceed after alerting maritime officials. 2.17 a.m. The bridge is lowered and traffic begins to continue its journey across. Many calls have been made to the police by now, but it takes a third call for a definitive response from the emergency services following a report that a safety barrier has been damaged and is hanging over the northbound carriageway. 2.34 a.m. Rescue services arrive on the scene. The police claim the first body was found dead in the water about four minutes later. 2.50 a.m. More emergency services are called, and the first divers are entering the water ten minutes later. Six hours later, the Nissan is recovered from the water, and two more people are confirmed dead. The identities of the dead are still not known, although it later emerges that their passports have been found in the wreckage. 220. The fourth body is recovered, as the dead are identified. An hour later, the last person is found in the water. Post-mortem examinations found that all the band members of Fiola Beach died from head injuries, apart from Thomas Lowe, whose cause of death is given as drowning. This is particularly poignant, as we shall reveal later. Eyewitness Kent Udin, 49, says he brought his sob to a halt on the bridge just before the bridge began to open to let the oil tanker through. The barriers were down. A taxi was stationed behind him 
To his right were two trucks. Uden remembers seeing lights approaching in his rearview mirror and said that the driver of the band's car flew past him on the left like a maniac, almost hitting his car before driving through both sets of barriers. He remembers hearing a muffled bang, but it was hard to understand what had happened. It was all so surreal, he said. The black Nissan accelerated forward at about 60 or 70 kilometers per hour and then careered through the second barrier. There was another boom. The whole incident lasted seconds. Uden could not tell if the car carrying Viola Beach had made it across the bridge. He got out of his sob and talked to the taxi driver, and they wondered if the car had, in fact, plunged into the canal. Along the way, they would pass metallic debris at the point where the raised section meets the road. Had the black Nissan made it across or not? No one at that point could tell. In the aftermath of the crash, Swedish police revealed they were looking at four lines of inquiry and post-mortems had begun on the bodies. One consideration is that technical failures on the bridge were to blame. They also looked at the road conditions and whether it could have been icy. Investigators considered the black Nissan might have had a problem with the wheels or the brakes. There was, of course, the possibility that the driver was under the influence of alcohol or drugs, or he may even have passed out or fallen asleep at the wheel. They also wondered whether the car may have been in cruise control mode and that the driver had, therefore, no control of the vehicle. Speculation was quick to take hold in the media. The British tabloid, The Sun, set a pair of amber flashing warning signals 900 meters from the bridge were turned off and could be to blame for the tragic accident. The newspaper also claimed there was a second set of faulty lights 200 meters from the bridge, leaving just one set of red warning lights 70 meters from where the band's car plunged into the canal. Swedish road authorities denied this claim, saying all the lights were functioning normally that fateful night. But the Swedish police do admit mistakes were made and that it took three calls before emergency medics responded, and they arrived 30 minutes after the car had already careened off the bridge. The police confirmed that 24-hour CCTV cameras were in operation at the approach to the bridge and it provided video surveillance eyes for the highway authority in case of emergency. Still images emerge of critical moments in the accident timeline. The photos show the scene immediately before the accident at 1.57 a.m., but the next still isn't recorded until 2.17 a.m. But wait, what happened to Viola Beach's car during the lost 20 minutes? when the Nissan sped off the bridge. What's even more troubling, the actual video footage between those critical times are never recovered. It turns out the recording is not automatically saved, and although the 24-hour tape can be rewound, it was not requested in time by the Swedish police. What really happened in those crucial few minutes between the time the black Nissan crashed through the two barriers and landed at the bottom of the canal, we will never know. As the police investigator will state, it's absolutely inexplicable. The next day, the news reported more information about the mysterious crash. The car that the band Viola Beach and their manager were travelling in was pulled from a canal near Stockholm in the early hours of yesterday morning. 
It had plunged down more than 80 feet into the water after crashing through a barrier on the motorway bridge. The Maritime Authority in Sweden says warning signs were in place and the barriers were down. An investigation is underway. The car passed through one of the barriers and then plunged into the canal. The bridge had been raised at the time. It is very tragic, of course. A police investigation is underway. We were looking to what happened and hope to find out if something failed technically as well, of course. But it's too early to say. The members of the Warrington-based band were Chris Leonard, River Reeves, Thomas Lowe and Jack Dakin. Their manager was Craig Tarry. Lars Berglund, one of the police officers investigating the crash on February 13th, told Sweden's newspaper Often Bladet that the way the band's Nissan accelerated past two crash barriers as the bridge was rising might have indicated some intent. The tabloid went on to label it a possible murder-suicide. The suggestion that the driver had deliberately driven off the bridge triggered a storm of protest and was quickly retracted. The newspaper apologized for their sensationalism. British newspaper The Daily Mail pieced together the events of the night by speaking extensively to Berglund and a key witness and viewing CCTV footage of the tragedy that had not been released to the public. Berglund told the Daily Mail the two in the front seat were killed instantly when the bridge hit them, causing fatal head injuries. But the three in the back were not wearing seat belts, so they were tossed around in the car. Two of the band members suffered fatal head injuries from the bridge, but one was bending forward, and the bridge did not hit him full force. So his injuries were not so severe, but he died from internal bleeding. Talking later to a local Swedish paper, Berglund gave another possible explanation, saying the driver of the Nissan may have lost concentration while squeezing past the stopped cars. Berglund went on to say the force of the initial impact could have knocked Craig Terry, the band manager, out. It was, again, speculation. But he might have been knocked out with his foot on the accelerator and had just gone into the second barrier, which caused less damage as the car struck the middle of it, creating less of an impact, said Berglund. However, he added that the fact that the car slowed down at first for the barrier cue meant the driver was not asleep. Apparently perplexed by the mystery surrounding the crash, he said there was no indication of any reason Terry would want to cause a crash after the band's successful gig earlier that night. Another theory police were working on was that the Nissan's cruise control system might have been to blame for the car speeding over the edge of the bridge. At the coroner's inquest in Warrington on March 3rd, the hearing was told that the witnesses on the night had made statements to the Swedish police, telling them that the Nissan stopped behind other vehicles at the barrier before speeding past them. The inquest heard that Terry could have had time to stop the vehicle after hitting the first barrier, but he continued in the middle of the road and hit the second barrier. Police Constable Michael Badley, who was sent to Sweden by the coroner to investigate the accident, told the inquest that Terry appeared to have complete control of the vehicle up until hitting the first barrier and had sufficient distance to react and stop before crashing into the bridge. The car was found upside down on the canal bed. Divers found Leonard in the front seat and Terry on the driver's side. River, Jack, and Thomas were all found outside the vehicle. They had been thrown out of the back seat of the car because they had not been wearing seat belts. When interviewed by the Daily Mail, Kent Uden, the key witness, expanded on his earlier statement and said nobody could have mistaken the hard shoulder for a lane. It was too narrow and that he was astonished that the Nissan didn't hit his car on the way through. It was really scary how he did it, Uden said. It was at such a high speed that I could feel my car vibrate as he shot past. My first reaction was, this guy's a criminal, probably on drugs, being chased by police or even another car. I was expecting another car to come chasing after him. 
The Nissan hit the barrier just a few feet in front of me. The barrier was down. There was no doubt about it. But I didn't see any brake lights and there was no hesitation. The normal reaction would be to stop the car, but it continued at the same speed over the bridge. Like, we're gonna make it, let's go. I heard the crash, then complete silence. In another twist, further speculation began that maybe the driver was trying to beat the bridge. The band's hometown of Warrington has three swing bridges crossing the Manchester Ship Canal. It is reportedly common for drivers in the area to try to speed across the bridges when they're about to be raised. People began to wonder, is this what the bandmates of Viola Beach and their manager were attempting at 2 a.m. on February 13th? The band was due to fly back to Britain early the next day. Maybe Craig Terry was in a rush to get back to the hotel so they could all get some sleep. But none of this explains why the driver did not stop the car when he could see the four-foot gap in the bridge ahead. Perhaps he wasn't in full control of the car. Could it be some other force was propelling the vehicle forward? Had the black Nissan been taken over by some supernatural entity? Had fate decided this was their time, and despite the best efforts of the men inside to prevent it, this was going to be their end. Does the fact Thomas Lowe was 27 years old have a bearing on the demise of Viola Beach and their manager the night before Valentine's Day? Had Thomas Lowe unwittingly taken his bandmates and manager with him to the infamous 27 Club? so much we don't know about the tragic crash that night. I was drawn to the story by the spirit of Jack and Thomas of Yola Beach, who have visited my dreams urging me to tell their story and keep their memory alive. Both feel that they left this world too soon and still want the opportunity to live in the hearts of their fans and families through their music. So I decided to turn to the astrological stars and numerology to see if we could find any answers. On February 13, 2016, the moon was conjunct Uranus in unpredictable Aries. Aries is a fire sign that represents impulsive action. It's bold, daring, and self-determined. When unchecked, this energy is aggressive and can make one feel emotionally attacked. Astrologers look at an individual's birth chart to explain or predict events by analyzing the inner workings of the individual. Accidents are unplanned and unforeseen. An accident is precisely that, an unexpected event, or is it someone's predetermined fate? How are accidents written in the stars? As explained in Rex Bill's modern classic, The Rulership Book, these sudden and seemingly random events are ruled by Mars and Uranus. When we look at the cause of death in astrology, we need to look at the 6th and 8th houses on a natal chart. The 6th house usually shows us diseases, which may lead to death, and the 8th house is concerned with the actual cause of death. Sometimes, however, we need to look at both to get an accurate picture of how or why someone has died. With this thought in mind, I will take a look at the natal charts of each member of Viola Beach. Craig Terry Unfortunately, the stars were not aligned on February 13th for band manager Craig Terry. He was born on September 6th, 1983, according to his Facebook page. Although he had sun in Virgo, his moon was in dramatic Aries, along with the day of the accident, 
leading to a sudden onset of emotional volatility and several other unexpected factors that caused the Nissan to drive off the bridge that night into the freezing canal water. Jack Dakin was the drummer of Viola Beach and was born on March 19, 1991, under the sensitive water sign of Pisces. He was a creative soul. If we look at his eighth house, which is associated with death, we can see that he had Neptune, god of the sea, and Uranus, planet of surprises in this house. This indicates that his death would have strongly been associated with water, and also it would have been a result of a shock or surprise, rather than a slow downward spiral, such as a chronic disease. Sadly, this appears to have been exactly true for the young drummer, and no one could have predicted he would meet such a violent and unexpected death in Sweden that night. There is certainly a lot of watery imagery going on in the astrological charts of the members of Viola Beach, and this continues when we look at guitarist River Reeves, whose name alone appears to show an eerie prophecy along with his other band members. He was born on December 14, 1996, under the adventurous side of Sagittarius, and his eighth house was ruled by the sign of Scorpio, which is also the sign of death. And although it doesn't indicate an early demise on its own, it does show that his accident would be linked to water in a foreign country. Chris Leonard was the charismatic lead singer of the band, born on February 6, 1996. He had Sun in Aquarius making him a free thinker and something of an offbeat character who would have found it easy to inspire others with his words and music. If we look at his eighth house, we can see that he has Sagittarius and Pluto. When we look at the cause of his death, Sagittarius often indicates a fall from a great height, which is what exactly happened to the lead singer when the car he was traveling in plunged over the side of the bridge in Sweden. Last, we have Thomas Lowe, the bass player of Viola Beach, and he was born on May 1st, 1988. He was a Taurus and he had a rising sign in Leo, which is the perfect combination for a bass player. His rising sign made him a natural and charismatic performer, and offstage he had a down-to-earth personality, which made him an important and valued member of the band. His chart also shows that he had Pisces in the North Node in his 8th house. When we look at the cause of death in the 8th house, Pisces, the sign of the fish, usually indicates accidents in water. This is exactly what happened that fateful night when he drowned in the freezing canal water, and it took over an hour before emergency services arrived to the scene of the accident. Another factor to consider is Thomas Lowe was 27 years of age at the time of his death. In astrology, the 27 age marks a turning point for individuals who are astrologically about to enter their Saturn return. In astrological lore, Saturn is the great taskmaster of the skies, and it means you need to get your act together or the universe will release an emotional storm in your life to force you to make significant changes. The previous deaths of several 27-year-old rock stars who joined the infamous club, like Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, Brian Jones, and Kurt Cobain are shrouded in mystery, leaving fans to speculate on each rock star's mysterious and untimely death. Conspiracy or curse, or a combination of both. Sadly for Viola Beach, they would become a musical note in history, and Thomas Lowe's name was added to the long list of musicians who died under unusual circumstances. What numerological significance of Viola Beach's life path number and karma play in the band member's death on the day of the crash? One thing we can immediately see from a numerology aspect is that February 13th, 2016 is a very significant date. The day of the accident adds up to six in numerology, which is a number that is ruled by Venus and I associate with karmic relationships. In numerology, six is actually considered one of the most harmonious and stable numbers. However, perhaps for that same reason, when something unexpected happens, and the six falls into discord and disharmony, it becomes possibly the most destructive and dangerous of all numbers. 
Chris Leonard was the lead singer of the band, and he was born on February 6, 1996. This means that he also had the life path number six and was born on the six, which again, I associate with karmic relationships and unexpected events that come out of the blue. It indeed appears to be what happened when Craig Terry, the driver of the band's car that night, failed to notice the safety barriers that would have stopped the car from speeding along the bridge and crashing. Instead, the cloud plowed through the barriers and drove off the bridge that night into the freezing canal water. Thomas Lowe, the bass player, was born on May 1st, 1988. This means that at the time of his death in 2016, he was going through a personal year six. I usually associate personal years one and nine with death and rebirth, but it is even more significant that when I see the number six repeated multiple times across the numerology charts of Viola Beach, including the day they died. Another member of the band who lost his life was River Reeves, the guitarist who was born on December 14th, 1996. What is significant about this? Well, his life path number is, you guessed it, six. When I see repeating patterns in numerology, then I know that this is not a coincidence, especially when it is a significant number such as six, which I believe shows a supernatural force at work. The other member of the band to die in the crash was Jack, who was the charismatic drummer. He was born on March 19, 1991, and this meant that he also had the life path number six. That is the important factor with numerology. It is just not possible for these numbers to keep repeating across all the charts of the band members and also be the number associated with the day they died, if fate was not involved. The final member of the band who tragically died that day, and who was the driver of the car, was manager Craig Terry. He was born on September 6, 1983, and he had the life path number 9, but was born on the 6th. Once again, the number 6 proves it has catastrophic significance in the numerology chart for the band members. Numerology doesn't work in a vacuum, but instead it is a cumulative effect of all the numbers. In the case of Viola Beach, the day of the accident was compounded by the karmic relationship they shared, the moon transit in Aries, and the destructive energy that came along with the number six vibration. And in the end, it sadly led to a tragic death by misadventure for all five men that day. Young lives ending too soon is always profoundly tragic. No parent wants to outlive their children. And when they also happen to be budding rock stars in the making, the tragedy seems somehow heightened. An immediate mythic status envelops them. They become iconic overnight. Fiola Beach had not even been signed to a label when their careers came to such a shocking end. But they had their own indie label and their infectious buoyancy and love for music. It was felt by everyone who knew them. Their zest for life was plain for all to see. As they say quite simply on their Facebook page, We are a really lovely four-piece indie pop band from Warrington. After the crash, a statement from the families of the band said, we are tremendously proud of everything the boys achieved in such a short space of time. Craig, Jack, Chris, River, and Tom shared a huge passion, talent, and dedication to music. Tributes were also paid to Mr. Terry, who was described as a man of unshakable optimism and a passionate Manchester City football club fan. Tributes were made at the lounge, the club where they began their careers. And Warrington Town Hall flew its flag at half-mast in the week following their deaths. The band had recorded songs for a six-track EP, which was originally scheduled to be released in 2016. When asked about the possibility of further recordings being released, the band's agent was quoted as saying, There's a lot of music a lot of demos, a lot of amazing songs. It'd be great if it got out. But now, 
Everybody's still grieving. We need to sit down and work out what we do with it. Fans organized a social media campaign to get the band's single, Swings and Water Slides, to the top of the UK singles chart. Oasis singer Liam Gallagher, Ian Brown of the Stone Roses, and rock band Kasabian lent their support. The single appeared at number 39 on the official chart update, published on February 15th, and it climbed to number 11 by the end of the week. Three days later, it briefly reached number one on the iTunes chart. All proceeds from the single would be donated to the families of the band members and of their manager. A few months later, on April 2nd, a tribute concert was staged at Warrington's Parr Hall with performances by several of the band's friends and their influences, including the Coral, the Courtineers, the Kooks, and the Blossoms. The Zootons also made a rare live appearance at the event. On June 26th that year, Coldplay, led by Chris Martin, paid tribute to Viola Beach at the Glastonbury Festival during their set by covering the band's song, Boys That Sing, and encouraged fans to buy the single. In 2017, Reeves' father, Ben Dunn, organized RivFest 17, a music event aimed at inspiring young artists to follow their dreams. The concert was held at Warrington's Priestley College on September 2nd and featured a headline appearance by Maximo Park and Billy Bragg. In 2017, the self-titled posthumous studio album containing nine tracks by Viola Beach was released in the United Kingdom on July 29th by Fuller Beans Records, the band's own label. The album peaked at number one on the UK Albums Chart. A young death is a loss of innocence and makes all of us feel vulnerable. And it's a spiritual reminder that we are not invincible and any one of us could die in an instant. Some young souls choose to sacrifice their own lives so that others may grow spiritually and may be part of a more significant soul contract they may have held with their family and friends. Through the young band members of Viola Beach and their thrust for life, not only their loved ones, but a whole community was reawakened. After all, the band's name, Viola Beach, is the very antithesis of the town they came from. Industrial Warrington, forged on the banks of the River Mersey. Death by Misadventure was produced by Cosmic Media and written by me, JC Nova. Our supernatural team of co-hosts includes the talented Eduardo Fahey in London, Tom Dre, our master numerologist and paranormal investigator in L.A., Paul Robinson, magi and musician in Marin, and myself, I'm a psychic astrologer and paranormal investigator in Los Angeles and San Francisco. This episode was recorded at Robin Sound Studios in Marin, California, and also at Union Recording Studio in West Hollywood, California. Kudos to sound engineers Paul Robinson and Noah Shanklin. A special thanks to audio producer Christopher Lang in Tucson, who brings each episode to life, and Paulina from Upper Planet in London. She's responsible for the super cool design of our official website. She's also the designer for one of our favorite true crime podcast, Case File. Please like and follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash Death by Misadventure podcast. Each episode is available for download direct via our website at deathbymisadventure.co.uk and also at iTunes, Google Play, CastBox, Spotify, Podbean, TuneIn, Radio Public, and Stitcher. 
Last but not least, our podcast is hosted by Libsyn. I'm JC Nova, and this has been Death by Misadventure. Thanks for listening. What if the key to a successful marriage was a deadly secret? Hulu presents Deep Water, starring Ben Affleck and Ana de Armas. 